bit, um, a bit of a recap for, for today, because um, we are in a way seeing that these three days as a bit of a learning journey that is building off each other. Um, and I think interestingly, uh, earlier today, we, we heard from UAVP who uh, on, on their experiences and challenges in building a learning network and turning that into um, almost like an organizational intelligence, uh, an organizational R&D capacity. Um, and equally, we had a conversation about the future of labs. Um, and again, one of the streams of thought, certainly not maybe less so in that session, but generally from around labs is whether they should be turned into R&D functions as well. Um, and I think this conversation kind of builds on both of those in the sense that we are not just talking about organizational R&D capacity, we're not just talking about units becoming more than uh, sort of uh, labs that are doing projects. Uh, we are talking about here entire sectors uh, and how we are thinking about the, the, the overall capacity uh, of a system or a sector um, and, and how that can be built into the ways of working, uh, the ways that, that um, we mobilize people the way that we uh, develop policies and then and so on. So with all of that, just to say that, that I think this theme is, is a very pressing one, uh, but it's also very difficult. Um, and for that reason, I'm, I'm very delighted that we are in company with, with Chris Vanstone today and Jason Pierman uh, from uh, Taxi and the Canadian government um, to talk more about their ongoing work of, of social R&D. Uh, and also, interestingly, they're going to be talking from two different positions from, from sort of inside, inside government, in Jason's case, and outside, or certainly in a hybrid sense, uh, uh, in Chris's case. So interestingly, um, it'd be interesting to see and hear what, uh, what they can sort of tell us about uh, driving this sort of effort from, from those two different positions. Um, and before I hand it over, I think what, what we're going to do today is, is going to be basically enable a bit of a conversation, but we will allow uh, Jason and Chris to, to kick us off, uh, kind of set the scene a little bit, invite the, us into their work. Uh, and then um, we'll invite both uh, you guys to, to, to feed in your questions and, and hopefully we can have a, a good reflective conversation and, and all be able to learn from each other in, in the process. So. Uh, Without further ado, I'll, I'll hand it over to Jason to kick us off uh, with, with some thoughts and, and we'll go from there. Jason. Great, thanks, uh, thanks Jasper. And uh, thanks everyone for, for tuning in. I'm, I'm super pumped about this conversation, obviously, um, but because uh, the, the topic is very interesting, but I also have a, a lot of questions and have kind of been at this for uh, the last few years. Uh, first within the Government of Canada as a, a lead for program experimentation, uh, one of our uh, ministries in the Canadian government, uh, and the role is primarily helping uh, program and policy units uh, test new ways of working and new ways of affecting uh, certain policy uh, directions. And as part of that mandate, uh, I was really lucky to be brought in uh, to a conversation uh, around social research and development uh, that are uh, the Canadian equivalent of taxi. Uh, it's, um, oh, it's, it's closed now, <laughs> so I've forgotten what the acronym stands for, but it was SIG. Uh, and, uh, and there was a, a fellow by the name of uh, Vinod Rajasankaran who was curating this network of uh, social R&D practitioners, so individuals within organizations uh, social mission organizations, be they government or nonprofits or foundations, who are trying to either find ways to do research and development in a social change context uh, or fund social change uh, research and development work. Uh, so, yeah, was really uh, lucky to be invited into this uh, community of practice or this network. Uh, it was where I first met Jesper, we invited him to uh, come and talk about some of the work. Uh, that was happening, I think it was Mind Lab at the time, or it might have been Nesta. But it was this really uh, a great introduction to the social innovation community in Canada, but also uh, across the globe. 
uh, and eventually I transitioned out of my role within the federal government leading program experimentation and took on uh, a role as being a social R&D fellow uh, with SIG and then uh, with uh, the McConnell Family Foundation in Canada and Community Foundations of, of Canada where my role was to uh, take over the curation of this network of social R&D practitioners. Uh, and by that time, we kind of invited uh, some international uh, friends and, uh, and family to, uh, to participate in a number of our gatherings. But we also really wanted to make that uh, this group not only a way to increase the quality of our social R&D craft, uh, but also to better articulate to funders and policymakers the kinds of enabling condition that was needed so that this craft could kind of be realized uh, and be uh, sustainable, to be frank, because uh, it's really hard. Uh, mentally, <laughs> uh, from a cognitive drain and cognitive load perspective, but always kind of trying to make the, uh, the, the case that it's as important for nonprofits and charities and, and public sector institutions to invest in uh, developing new insights, uh, uncovering new uh, pathways to, to social or environmental change, and then converting that new insight into uh, like program adaptations, like new kinds of services, uh, and that's not really what social change organizations are really supposed to do, uh, in at least in the Canadian or, or the North American context. Uh, it's primarily like, how many people did you serve? Uh, you know, and, and if you're not uh, investing all of your time and your efforts into serving more people, then like, you're not really doing social change work. And, and we kind of said, well, you need to be able to do delivery work but you also need to do development work because otherwise we'll just keep implementing like the same thing that we've been implementing for the last, in some cases, four decades. Uh, so this notion of what, like, what is social R&D? If somebody asks me that question, uh, it's often, you know, like think about R&D in other sectors, uh, whether it's FinTech or life science, life sciences, uh, you know, you pick the sector, uh, if you kind of tell somebody on the street, like, oh, R&D is you know, really important, they'll, they'll kind of agree with you and they'll take that for granted. And we're kind of make the, the case that for social change efforts and environmental change efforts, it's the same thing. Uh, it's structured, systematic activities to create new solutions or to build new insights and uncover uh, new kind of pathways to achieve a, a better outcome. Uh, and having the skills to convert that new understanding uh, into, uh, into new interventions. And so the social sector needs to be able to do that too. Uh, and the good news is like there's a tradition, at least in the North American uh, context of organizations, social mission organizations that, that do R&D well. Uh, and I had the benefit of spending a lot of time with many of them. Uh, and they all kind of have a variety of uh, methods that they uh, apply to better understand uh, problems, uh, whether it's, you know, if you're trying to uh, increase the uh, inclusion for uh, individuals with different abilities, uh, you know, really understanding like what their hopes and dreams are, uh, what are some of the really critical gaps or service failures, uh, understanding that is really important. And so some organizations, In With Forward is a great example, uh, who Australia or people on the call that are from Australia uh, probably know of them. They're, they're really important for us in Canada. Uh, they pair deep ethnography with service design. So the deep ethnography allows them to better understand uh, the, the challenges and, and the nature of solutions. But then the service design allows them to actually do something with those insights uh, to create novel solutions that can be onboarded by existing service providers. So that that's just an example of this notion of that high quality R&D uses a, a number of methods. Uh, it's not just, you know, we do uh, innovation labs. Uh, maybe you do, but unless there are a number of methodologies that are part of your practice, uh, you might not actually be doing strong R&D. Uh, 
Another great example is this uh, community center called uh, Vivo for Healthy Generations in Western Canada. Uh, around 10 years ago, they kind of were looking at uh, the kinds of outcomes they were getting through their programming compared to their peers kind of across the country. Uh, again, community center, like nonprofit structure, uh, pretty standard. Uh, interventions, they have like a building <laughs> and they did programming within the building. But then they decided to benchmark their outcomes uh, compared to the evidence and their peers. And then they realized there was a gap. And then they started to say, okay, so what can we do to close this gap? They hired uh, somebody with uh, service design experience, or maybe it was a designer, I can't recall. But basically they started really small and then they had a small team. And then at year five, they were like, you know what? Like the world and what communities need is changing too fast. R&D needs to be everyone's job. So they flipped their business model. And so instead of like, or their operation mo operating model. So instead of like 10% of their staff being focused on R&D, now 90% of their staff are focused on R&D. Uh, and it's mostly about uh, being really attentive to what how the community is engaging with programming, uh, documenting that as a uh, regular practice, and then having some ongoing uh, function to harvest those insights and then to craft uh, some interventions uh, or some, uh, some modifications to existing interventions to uh, get signals on what could be working better. Uh, and so that's kind of at the low scale R&D that everyone's doing, but they still have the dedicated uh, R&D team that curates a lot of that and has some bigger uh, projects that are a bit more speculative uh, that the smaller team works on. So all that to say like social R&D can look like many different things uh, and be uh, consistent and reflective of the social change kind of community. You have small nonprofits, you have big foundations. Like th there's an R&D model that kind of works uh, for everyone. And when I was a social R&D fellow, we spent a lot of time trying to better understand whether social R&D is kind of unique. And I kind of already mentioned our narrative was that R&D in social change uh, contexts, it's as important as R&D in other contexts. But then we kind of dove into the literature and did some observational studies and uh, a bit of other uh, research work to like test that hypothesis. And the good news is like, yeah, R&D, that's social mission oriented, has a lot of similarities to R&D in other sectors. But there are a few big differences that worth uh, pointing out. And this, Chris will kind of get into it and ta he can speak to it quite nicely. But this notion of power dynamics and really working uh, in partnership with the communities that you serve that's a key feature of a strong social R&D practice. Another really important feature is like uh, making sure you're sure you're lined up well to do this cyclical kind of systematic work. Uh, and so part of that is permissions from your kind of, uh, from an executive's kind of org like hierarchy perspective. You wanna make sure that you can actually complete a few R&D cycles which is more than just like a six month project. Really need to line that up. Uh, and then making sure that the funding uh, environment that you have, you don't need to have a lot, but you have to have enough so that you can do some of this more uh, discovery oriented work. In addition to any of the delivery work that you do, uh, you don't only end up being able to go so far before like funding dries up and, and you can't uh, push it any further. That's just kind of at the, organizational level and how I think of R&D. But, uh, but we've been really lucky because there's a whole lot of evidence and scholarship around what R&D looks like and how we should think about it from other sectors, as I've already mentioned. And one of these big pieces uh, of, of insight is that R&D is actually a team sport. Like you need a lot of organizations doing high quality R&D so that you have a critical mass of insights that's being passed back and forth within a particular sector. So let's uh, take uh, children aging out of uh, foster care as an example. There's a lot that could be generated from insights within that particular social change domain. But 
layer that on top of uh, youth employment. Like, there, so there's going to be some insights from these various social change domains that are complementary, and where there's going to be a remix of that information that leads to one of those actors achieving like a breakthrough solution. And that's how R&D works when you look at other sectors. And so this notion of spillover and spillover only happening when you have a critical mass of R&D that's happening. So you actually have to solve for quality of R&D. So that has to be high, but you also need to solve for quantity. And that starts to push you towards thinking about innovation systems and R&D uh, systems and, and networks of supports to make sure that uh, the talent is there within the sector, that the right kinds of supports, be it uh, funding or training uh, are there and just common infrastructure. Like in other sectors, you take for granted that you have like uh, cables that allow you to connect various uh, computing uh, centers together uh, so that you can like do some pretty advanced computational work. That's shared infrastructure that somebody actually invested in. And more often than not, it's in the public sector. But when you look at the social change space, we don't really see that orientation of sh shared infrastructure that allows for certain kinds of uh, research and development or innovative uh, solution development uh, that eventually, uh, if you kind of believe that evidence from other sectors are applicable in this sector, uh, that that spillover increases the probability that breakthroughs occur. And uh, yeah, anyway, so that that's a lot of like geeky, R&D uh, background. Uh, what I'm lucky to be able to do and have been doing for the last uh, year and a half, going on two years, is applying a lot of that theory in the youth employment space. Uh, so I'm the head of R&D and impact measurement for the Government of Canada's uh, youth employment program. So a lot of these fundamentals around uh, organizational level R&D, and sectoral R&D infrastructure, and even how we go about doing our work, taking more of an R&D frame, uh, has been what we've been trying to do over the last two years. And, uh, and yeah, it's been really exciting to start seeing some of the results. And, uh, and it's been really important to uh, help uh, my program think about how we uh, support the sector to recover uh, from the COVID pandemic. Maybe I'll stop there because <laughs> that, that was a lot of me talking. I don't know, Jesper, if you wanted me to get a bit more precise on anything. Yeah, I mean, no, thank you, Jason. That, I think that was a really useful introduction uh, to the concept and, and to your work. Uh, maybe I have just one quick follow-up question for you, just on what you just said, basically. One of the things I am curious about is what is an R&D agenda look like when it gets brought into government um how does it how does it um well does it change shape uh do you need to become a bit more pragmatic you mentioned methods and expertise for example uh i'm gonna assume that it's a bit of a difficult game to bring some of that into government uh, but you tell me uh, what, what does that look like in, in your youth uh, program work yeah, it's it's hard. <laughs> it's really hard. Uh, you not only have to uh, organize your team well to kind of do R and D uh, and try to do it well, uh, and there are all the constraints of like doing R and D within a bureaucracy. Uh, but the way that most social programs, at least in the Canadian context, are are organized. Uh, we have to use the, the, the mechanisms that are available to us to, to engage with citizens, to, to spend money, to, to hire people. Uh, and so the, the rules and the tools that haven't really gone through a significant update in, in a while, you know, some might say a, a century, <laughs> uh, you know, it sometimes feel like I'm trying to get a, a sailing boat to perform 
uh, in a way that it that it just can't. But the good news is is that we have a lot of evidence to rely on in terms of how we should be thinking about what we fund. Uh, we have a lot of practical experience in terms of how to do more kind of experimental work within government. Uh, and we're also lucky that we have a leadership cohort at the moment that, uh, and I think, you know, across most government of Canada programs that are really interested in better serving uh, citizens and doing that in a more dynamic and adaptive way. So the permissions there uh, were really though, kind of pat we're past the permission stage where we got the permission to do this. We got the funding to do this. And now it's like, you know, implementation. And, you know, that, that's always the hardest part. Uh, but I, I think I underestimated how difficult it would be to, uh, to move a bureaucracy to do some of the things that, that we're trying to do, but we're getting, we're getting traction and, and we have progress. Uh, I just, yeah, I wish it wasn't so hard, but it is what it is. Thanks, Jason. I have many more questions written down already, but I will let you off the hook for a little bit. Uh, we want to hear from, um, from Chris as well uh, before maybe jumping too far into conversation. Um, so, uh, Chris, over to you for a bit of an intro on, on your work, and then we'll. Thank you, Jesper. Uh, thanks, thanks for the invitation, and thank you, Jason. It's always so good to hear your your latest. Uh, Work and as uh, as Jesper uh, said, we're, we're Taxi, the Australian Centre for Social Innovation, is approaching this from uh, outside of uh, government, but trying to work closely with with government in uh, in in the process. So, sort of re recognising the the very real challenges that uh, Jason and his team have put themselves in to make this stuff actually work in the sort of uh, in the heart of government. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, coming to you here from uh, Ghana land, uh, uh, people of the Adelaide Plains in uh, South Australia, and just want to pay uh, respects to elders, past, present, and futures. Future in uh, on these lands, the lands my colleagues are coming from, and Gadigal lands, uh, and indeed uh, other uh, First Nations peoples on uh, Turtle Island or Aetora or other lands that might be uh, on this call. And I, th I think one thing, uh, I'll round back to this, but I think one thing that's very important for us in uh, Taxi as we're building uh, and hoping, building or renewing or strengthening social R&D systems in Australia is that we do that in a way that really builds in First Nations knowledges and innovators and innovations and ways of doing and being and valuing. And we do that from the start because we don't want, uh, you know, we are renewing an infrastructure. We don't want to build in uh, the kinds of uh, discrimination and inequity that many of our systems perpetuate now. And we think building this stuff in at the start could be a way to uh, address some of this in uh, in a helpful way. So I just wanted to make that that connection. Um, where does this? As I was talk, talk a little bit about where this started for us, and I think it starts in. Um, uh a number of different places uh taxi for the last 10 years has been one of the things we've been doing is creating and trying to scale social innovations of different kinds and uh we found that very hard um we uh have created we did you know everything you meant to do by the book we did some good process we uh did some collaborative design with people experiencing challenges uh i'm thinking here of our sort of family by, family by family program and uh it works it creates results we've got eight evaluations and so you know you start to think well if you do everything that you know uh if you do that work this stuff should scale right but no it hasn't. Uh, you know, ten years down the line, we've got uh, a second site now in uh, uh, in Stoke on Trent in the UK, which is very exciting for us. But that's ten years of really sort of uh, sort of scraping by, and um, really, uh, I, I think, sort of mostly surviving because of very. Uh, uh, 
uh, warm, hospitable, open-minded people in the South Australian government that have helped uh, keep that uh, keep that program alive, really, and fought for it within their own uh, within their own systems and sort of you know scraping together end of year funds and all of those things that many of you will be familiar with. And our story is, uh, I think, not uncommon, and many of you in this call might have experienced something similar. And you know, maybe the social innovators' lot is to uh, fight and struggle and weave through the status quo, but actually many of the people that we work with uh, uh, and our colleagues and partners are a bit tired uh, and a bit exhausted and a bit from fighting the system and where, where, where we do see good stuff happening and spreading uh, it's often despite some of those infrastructures that are in place not because of them but maybe that could be different and that's the question I think we've been asking at Taxi for a number of different years and in a number of uh, a number of different ways. Uh, what would it take to create the conditions for social innovation? I think if there's one thing we've learnt uh, over the last ten years, it's that doing innovation enough isn't enough to make innovation mainstream. Uh, you also have to create the conditions for innovation. And so we started to imagine what that might be. And um, for me, I think one, one project was uh, probably about four years ago, we were working on what would a social purpose economy look like in South Australia, the state that I live and working. And um, uh, you sort of start imagining what that will be like. And you start to think, oh, that would actually be really different from how we live now. And uh, it's also like, oh, you know, this, you know, this future stuff, it's meant to be part of this innovation work, but we don't have to sort of dream of what that reality might be like. And it'd be like, ah, oh, so you'd invent something that would work and then funds would like flow to it automatically and it would scale and grow. And uh, we'd have all of these models that we could pick off the shelf that uh, uh, ha have a really strong evidence base. Uh, and uh, we'd have people uh, coming up from school and university sort of uh, really trained in this social innovation stuff. And hey, maybe they'd even teach people about social innovation and the ways to change the world in schools. Maybe my kids would go to after school clubs about social innovation and not uh, soccer or soccer as well as soccer, something like that. But like this, it's quite a different reality. If you think about it that way, it could be quite a different reality. And also for myself, I think I also had a taste of this reality. Um, I spent five years um, working uh, in Britain's biggest biscuit manufacturer. Um, McVitie's for those of you that know them so hobnobs uh, digestives and the like uh, and I worked in an interdisciplinary team of uh, chefs and marketeers and food technologists uh, and we spent uh, those years sort of innovating and creating new kind new kinds of you know uh, incremental changes to the hobnob or radical things like the roast beef hobnob Mars bar um, and um, there was a really um, uh, th there was a really sophisticated 11 stage process that you had to get your ideas through. So 11 stages of kind of biscuit innovation. Uh, and in those five years, I never got anything through. Nothing hit the shelves because nothing was rigorous enough to stand up to those uh, uh, gates and benchmarks. Um, but this is a really different experience as Jason's been talking about in the social problem solving, social change space where we don't have this sort of uh, rigor around process and we certainly don't have the kinds of ecosystems around social uh, addressing these social challenges um, that we could do and that we see in other sectors. You know, of course, many of us on this call will have uh, a couple of doses, maybe three of uh, a COVID vaccine in our arms at the moment. Uh, and this is less than two years after uh, the, uh, the pandemic started. Uh, and we have that so quickly. Yes, there was a lot of money invested into it, but there's already a pretty sophisticated infrastructure for people to do early stage experimentation, to share the sort of sequencing of the genome, to, if I'm getting my words, right uh to kind of uh, uh to uh and a rigorous structure to test and develop on uh animals and then people uh new uh, new medicines uh, vaccines in this case um and that stuff's been legislated legislated by government for over a hundred years 
So it's not that government doesn't know or doesn't invest into our research and development. We do it all the time. Uh, we have some pretty sophisticated investment in um, agricultural research and development in Australia. So uh, wine, eggs, mangoes, uh, they all have their own sort of uh, coordinating bodies to uh, distribute money around research and development and to ensure that um, uh, the parts of these uh, uh, agricultural systems add up to um, uh, bigger something bigger than um, uh, than, they, than they would individually. So um, we began to ask ourselves the question: Well, what could we learn from these uh, existing research and development uh, systems? Um, but also, what would it need for um, this to work in uh, the kinds of challenges that we work on at Taxi and many of you on this call will work and so that's things like uh, mental health, um, home and housing, um, child protection, uh, regenerative communities, all these sorts of, in all of these sorts of areas, um, we're seeing there's a real urgency. Things, uh, for example, in Australia, we've seen uh, a real growth in um, uh, mental illness and poor mental well-being over the last few years. Uh, it's uh, this, the a recent report found that it was something like uh, we it costs Australia something like ten times what we spend on education in one year. Uh, in men, uh, mental illness costs Australia of that through loss of earnings and through providing support to that. So imagine if we could make like a 10, 15% improvement in that, 10, 15% saving with the equivalent, we could double the education budget. Like this is not small money we're talking about, yet we're not nearly as organized, as sophisticatedly as around that as we are around our eggs or our mangoes or our avocados, but we could be perhaps if we work out the right way to do it. And that really, that's really Taxi's journey is we've been trying to work out, well, what could this social R&D thing be? And thankfully, we've been able to uh, build a lot on uh, what Jason and his colleagues have done, uh, particularly work thinking around social R&D processes um, and been able to build on all of that good stuff that's been happening in science and uh, in agriculture and other commercial industries. Uh, and uh, so I'll talk maybe a little bit more about sort of what we think we need to add to uh, what we think that is and then what we think we need to add to that to really make it work in uh, the kinds or to address the kinds of social problems that we're trying to address. Um, how am I doing for time, Jesper or James? I've just kind of lost track. Uh, you're, you're okay. Uh, if you want to share <laughs> the... the models. Yeah, I'll just share... I'll just share uh, screen here if I can. So, um, this is sort of the de facto R&D system we see in Australia, hopefully coming up uh, soon. But we're really, um, are we able to see that? Yes, great. Um, so social R&D now in Australia, and I'm generalizing because there are kind of pockets of great practice and some really interesting sort of smaller systems that are kind of all starting to organize in a really good way. Um, but we see this ongoing cycles of uh, fail, review, reform, repeat. And this just goes on and on. And in Australia, we sort of have these sort of royal commissions, big, expensive, multi-year reviews, often led by senior judges. Uh, uh, that uh, that and you know we've had in some cases in things like child protection. I think we've had probably about ten of those in uh, the last uh, ten years uh, in various uh, in various forms. Um, but at, of course, at the fringes, we're seeing some really isolated innovation and really promising things, despite. Uh, the conditions. So um, if you start to look at um, uh, break down existing R&D systems, they've got a few different elements. One of them is workforce. We've got to think about how we, and I'm talking here about social R&D ecosystems rather than processes, um, but we've got to have people create this, create the conditions that make people want to work 
in social R&D. You know, we want people to dream of being social innovators or education reformers the way they might dream of being a games designer or something like that. Uh, and we want to make those really good connections between education and industry that we see in, in some places. I um, mean, you know, Germany is very good at this sort of placements between um, uh, universities and, uh, and, 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 and industry and thinking about what that might what that might mean in our context. Um, of course, we've got to do innovation and we've got to sort of support that entire innovation journey. And I think in social R&D, that means we've got to have systems that invest in dreaming about what might be possible. What are the futures that we actually want to live in? That sort of really social fiction. Do you think about the importance science fiction has had for, uh, uh, for science? Uh, but what about social fictions that really dream about what our social lives uh, might be in, in the future? Uh, then we need that early stage innovation and experimentation. We need to be able to take that, what works to scale, whether that's as principles or programs or services or policies um, and uh, with an evidence base. Um, and then we need to be able to set our systems up so that people can adapt that and scale that. And, um, you know, uh, about eight years into developing family by family model, uh, we reflected on the fact that we develop a, a model that works and then we realised that actually very few organisations in Australia take models from elsewhere. There isn't actually, like, that's not how it works. Like we completely missed that. Um, uh, people just don't adapt things they might kind of borrow ideas but essentially everybody kind of builds builds their own that's the sort of and it's not that's that's sort of the space that not-for-profits are pushed into by the kind of commissioning system that sits uh sits around them it's a very logical it's a very logical choice but maybe we could organize that stuff differently so innovation needs to be supported uh not only it needs money it needs people it needs capability it means management capability all of these things to specialist kinds of technical support uh, all the way through the journey um oh sorry um my slides are running away with me um coordination uh like with eggs, we need bodies that are kind of coordinating uh, these systems um, and making sure that they are greater than the sum of their parts. Um, and we need incentives. You've got to want to do this work. And actually, in Australia today, if you're, for example, a not-for-profit chief executive, say, there's very little incentive for you to actually do innovation. If you create something that works, you'll probably find it really hard to fund. You're going to have to make. Uh, you're going to have to convince people within your own organisation that this is a smart thing to do. Uh, you might be seen as a bit of a troublemaker because you're, you're going to be asking for different kinds of money or different kinds of systems. Uh, so there's very few, and you're not going to end up on the front page as you know. You're not uh, you're for you know doing good work here. This is not sort of how we celebrate social innovation in Australia. Uh, you're more likely to be pulled up for doing something risky or different. Um, and so if you think about the cachet that people like, uh, you know, the excitement we have about new phones or the excitement that uh, the cachet we give Elon Musk for kind of getting to space and back. Uh, but we don't have that kind of uh, uh, sort of social um, um uh, yeah, there's just not that, that same kind of appreciation there, but we could think about how we create that because these are all, there are these sort of soft and hard parts of um, uh, the um, uh, social R&D ecosystems. Um, but as many of you are probably thinking, taking social R&D as it stands uh, in commercial and science spaces into social problem solving would actually be a really bad idea. I think, um, and there are at least six reasons uh, why. Um, they're often not designed for dealing with the kinds of complex interrelated problems that we work on. Um, they tend to be designed to meet the main need of paying customers rather than uh, beneficiaries. Uh, there are, of course, the issues of experimentation with people. Uh, Social problem solving, certainly in Australia, is so politicised, uh, ideology decides rather than evidence, so what's the point? 
Uh, research and development is really good at creating futures that people don't want to live in. So if you think about social media and the effects, the unintended, I think, effects that's had on our democracies, uh, if you see you know, what's being said from former Facebook employees and uh, the leaks around the effects that's having on uh, people's mental health, uh, I think most poignantly sort of Instagram and uh, young women's body image, uh, like this is not the world I think that anybody really wants to live in. Um, and, uh, uh, and we have to, we don't want to do that in the social space where we're actually, you know, we're working on really serious stuff here. Um, and, and of course, as I said at the start, uh, we could build R and D systems that are brilliant at, uh, reinforcing, uh, dominant culture, white dominant culture over, uh, indigenous, uh, peoples and uh, people of color. And let's not do that. But I think you can address all of these things. Um, and uh, if we build in people at every level of this, um, and uh, that could mean collaborative design processes, but I think it also means uh, participatory and deliberative processes um, built in. So imagine, imagine if uh, the research and development spend on uh, mental health in Australia was governed in part by people with lived experience of living with mental illness. Imagine if uh, research and development around education was in part governed by children and young people and parents and employers. And imagine if these new kinds of institutions could last longer than a four year political cycle. Imagine if we created things that actually had the kinds of duration uh, that could uh, start to measure up to this long problem solving that we're faced with, uh, you know, mental health, home and housing, the climate crisis uh, that's playing out in such visceral ways here in Australia. Um, they're not things that we're going to solve quickly. We need to match the governance and the investments and the rhythm and the pace to the size and length and shape of the challenge. Um, and I don't think government's up uh, the right shape of thing to do that, certainly not on a four year cycle, but we could have these new kinds of institutions that can do that. And so what we're hoping to do in Australia, and we are just really at the start, although if I've got still got time, I'll, I'll share one little glimpse of hope, um, is to open the conversation about this to start to get people to think about this. And it's really struck me, Jason, actually, when you when uh, you said with your own work, how um, many people in the social sector aren't aware, actually, that this sort of R&D system stuff does does exist, like other sectors have it. Um, and I, I took from a conversation we had, Jason, about this idea of creating some kind of FOMO. Uh, so sort of like, what? They do this for eggs, but they don't do this for children that are in out of home care? That's bonkers. I think it is bonkers. It is bonkers, but like we um, we could, uh, but we could be doing this. I think part of what we're trying to do is raise that awareness, and then really try and connect with uh, systems where there is a um, uh, a degree of interest. And I think do some of the uh, some of the. It, I think our logic is sort of similar to what Jason's doing there. Is sort of trying to identify fields or sectors where the conditions are ripe for this, and then to support them to do experiments uh, in those particular uh, particular spaces. Uh, we're also really interested about what we could do about getting some kind of social innovation learning into schools or perhaps after school clubs and how we can really uh, kind of create that um, groundswell of interest in social change and social progress and social innovation. Um, and we also, like Jason, I think, recognise that we need to think some more, write some more and talk some more about this because there are a lot of concepts that, that still need to be worked out. Um, maybe just one, one, uh, one story to finish on, uh, and Ash is, oh, hang on, see, here's some things. I didn't tell you about this. So if you're interested in this stuff, um, uh, this is a great COVID benefit. We all know what a QR code is now. Um, but there are some, uh, we've written about this uh, um, in a much more fluent way in a report. Uh, and we've also started to document some of the patterns that uh, exist in R&D systems and to think about they might, if you want to have a conversation with your colleagues about this, you could use them to start that conversation and to um, uh, think about what you might we might take from science and from business uh, into the social problem solving, as well as documenting some of those um, uh, people-powered 
solutions, the kinds of patterns we think uh, that could help make progress and ensure that people are really integrated this and we're making futures that people uh, want to be part of. Um, interestingly, having knocked uh, cycles of fail, reform, repeats, Cycles of reform are actually a really interesting space to introduce some of this thinking, certainly in uh, in Australia. And so uh, my colleague Ash is on the call. We recently worked on something called the uh, Future Skills for Victoria Review. Um, and that was looking at a review of post-secondary education in the state of Victoria. Um, a lot of vocational education. Um, and... Uh, we just one person, one group contributing to that review. But I think we were able to influence some thinking about actually here you've got a system that's playing out across one state. Um, you could think and lots of, you know, de facto experiments happening because you've got different teachers teaching things differently in different ways. How about you think about building some of the systems for research and development within this relatively small uh, system? And the review uh, recommends that they do that. So they are creating some labs uh, that uh, are about exploring new kinds of teaching that are also about sort of socially progressive things like clean technology. Um, and they're also uh, really building in a kind of learning system within this uh, system is all about learning, but actually sort of learning what kinds of teaching work, what works in terms of ensuring equity in these uh, in these different locations and spreading, the, identifying that and then spreading that across the system. So this is one place where by getting involved in that point of reform, we think we've been able to create a little bit of influence uh, to move something towards uh, um, as something that's more um, uh, hospitable to research and development. And I will uh, stop there. Thanks very much, Chris, for that introduction and, and sharing of ongoing work. Um, very much fitting uh, the, the title of, the, of, of our, uh, our sessions here. I think, I mean, the, there's so many ways we can we can go on with this conversation. And I, maybe I'll um, try to pick up what what Ash was was uh, asking uh, Jason. Um, and maybe you want to speak on this Ash, as well, but, but my thoughts certainly went uh, to the question of partnership models. Um, uh, the one that I know best is actually forming with Forward, Jason, as you mentioned, their work uh, and how they are partnering with uh, networks of community organizations um, as a way of mobilizing the system from I don't know if it's right to call it the bottom up, but certainly kind of the logic there is the practice, new practice obviously needs to be experimented with locally uh, in, in institutions. And it's not enough to do it in one place. You have to do it in sort of parallel places. You have to learn across uh, in peer learning uh, mechanisms and so on. And then also you are staying, you're standing stronger once you actually have uh, promising practices happening. Uh, and you'll be able to have a different conversation, I guess, ideally or in theory, with um, with policymakers and decision makers and so on uh, around kind of actually supporting uh, this uh, more at scale and, and so on. Um, I guess I, and I don't know the recent kind of uh, results, but, but that was even with that model, it was a challenge to really get the the mainstream system kind of listening to what they were doing. Um, but, but it's still an interesting model in terms of having kind of thinking about it in a network sense and, and so on. I guess that my, my question is for both of you, and, and I don't know if you want to expand, Ash, as well, because um, uh, you're asking about um, uh, how, you know, diverse R&D pockets can somehow kind of be connected up from a, let's say, government stewardship, um, which is a, a similar but different way of, of thinking about it. I think. So, so yeah, reflections on partnership models, both in terms of um, kind of bottom up approaches, as well as what what can government do. Yeah, that, so this is a, a really important question, and I think the experience that uh, we had through the social R and D fellowship, like that was practically our, our job, like to make sense of what the diverse R&D practices across Canada were telling us with respect to what 
like what are some unique practices that are highly relevant kind of your positive what are your positive deviants doing that should be mainstreamed across the social change kind of fabric in Canada because they're kind of testing these new models of working uh, both like with institutions as well as with communities and individuals uh, so like what does this brave new world look like and how can we distill it down to some key themes that was part of our function the other part of our function was so we we want more of this and we need to help policymakers and funders better understand what it actually takes to do this work and how to actually fund it well and what are some of the barriers that these current practitioners are facing that we need to resolve and so like the fellowship worked with the community of practice to t and and funders and policymakers to their credit uh, to come up with uh, solutions that address a lot of the, uh, the things that were slowing people down. Now, from a programmatic perspective, what we try to do within our program is take more of a portfolio kind of sense-making approach. And so we know that we're not the only ones in the youth employment ecosystem pursuing R&D. Uh, and so how do we be in conversation with uh, folks that we're funding, uh, folks that we're not funding, like folks that are closer to the ground and can kind of help better uh, paint that picture. Uh, we see a small slice of it. Uh, others see a small slice of it. So how do we be in conversation with everyone so that we have a better sense of what that picture looks like? So we're really interested in uh, portfolio sense making and like UNDP is doing this really well now. Uh, Climate Kick has been doing this for a bit. Uh, so we're trying to figure out how we can apply some of that know-how within uh, uh, within our, our particular social change space, uh, youth employment. The, the other thing that I'd offer, uh, and again, taking inspiration from other sectors, uh, is this notion of R&D consortiums. So we have a few uh, organizations that we fund that have uh, like an innovation mandate like end to end. So R&D is part of their project. Uh, scaling is part of their, or demonstration is part of their project. Scaling is part of that project. And, and part of scaling is supporting uh, other organizations within the sector to adopt uh, some of the innovations and kind of insights that are emerging. And so we've brought them together and we sit with them as a member, as part of this R&D consortium where we compare notes on what we're learning, but we also talk about shared challenges and the hypotheses that we're testing, like our R&D portfolio that's going after something particular. Uh, a really good example is uh, wayfinding for youth. So, you know, maybe 40 years ago, there were a few youth employment uh, organizations in every community. Now there are hundreds. Uh, and so with that volume, you introduce complexity. And so how's the youth supposed to navigate that system? Uh, and so one of the things that we do know is that, you know, all of these organizations have some kind of a web property. They probably have some digital infrastructure. So can we use kind of machine learning and data science tools to better map that ecosystem and help youth actually navigate through it? So we had like this small uh, thought experiment that we commissioned around aligning taxonomies so that we could like link up all these puzzle pieces. And because we were doing like R&D and we started with a thought experiment, what we learned was like, why would you build a taxonomy now when you have data science? <laughs> like you can use uh, AI to like build a dynamic taxonomy for you, like on demand. Uh, this is what Google does. This is what Amazon does. Uh, so that you're looking for one thing, they find it for you, but then they recommend something else. Uh, and all of that volume of searching, you can do like a regression to figure out like what are the pathways that people on average are going after given certain kinds of uh, search patterns. And it's not expensive. Like that is like, so we have this tagline, not it's not taxonomies anymore, it's data science. And so like we wouldn't have been able to get there 
if we didn't have this R&D consortium. Organizations that were trying to figure out similar things and we pooled our like mental capabilities and our resources to work together to just do a thought experiment to start. And then that's kind of because this is R&D, so many opportunities and each member is pulling out different parts of, uh, of the insights. So we're seeing the spillover. Uh, and yeah, so just like trying to go, like, so you can do this really broad through portfolio sense making, or you could do it a bit more narrow through things like R&D consortiums. And we've tried both and they're both highly applicable. Mm. It's great, great to hear about this cons that consortium um, model, Jason. I think that's, it's just that, that idea that you like, uh, and I sort of see it in Australia when we talk about it too, that actually maybe everybody in the social sector doesn't need to do the same thing. Maybe we don't all have to compete for delivering services, but maybe some organizations or consortia could develop specialisms that are, are about developing and uh, working out what works and then, uh, and, and, and then scaling them to other people. But you know, we don't sort of certainly in Australia, we don't see that differentiation or even that 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 idea that that you could do that or you could commission for that. Um, and I think the sort of the theme of partnership here is so so important in this work, yes, because I think it's partly sort of almost beyond partnership. I think part of it is about people recognizing what system they're part of and recognizing that actually they can only really get the outcomes that they are seeking if they see themselves as part of that system. Um, so I, I think, for example, uh, within, let's take mental health, because we've been using it a lot, uh, but within that, by far the biggest sort of de facto research and, uh, and development spend would be into universities doing research on this, in and around this topic, certainly in Australia. Um, but I suspect we're not seeing the translation of that research, and there could be a number of different reasons for that. Organizations might not be set up to take it on. It might not have uh, the kind of relevance that it could to, to to those things. So I think if we start to look at uh, how knowledge, I guess it's, it's quite, it's quite abstract, but how knowledge, and I think you have to look at how knowledge and ideas are flowing and turning into outcomes and look at that flow across all of those different kinds of uh, sort of systems within, like a, you know, a relatively small system like the mental health system. Um, uh, then I think we can sort of start to join up I think the other thing I wanted to say and something that we're, we're really interested in at Taxi because we've seen some really promising, um, I guess, outcomes from our early experiments with it is the power of um, impact networks across fields and sectors. So connecting um, uh, sort of this is a lot of this is sort of building and people learn a lot of it coming out of North America, learning people learning what works about how to orchestrate networks to create impact. Um, and um, we've been adopting a lot of that and adapting it for Australia and starting to join up people who really care about impact across all of these different sectors. And then I, we hope this can be a way to sort of create a bit of a groundswell of change by sort of helping people recognize to build that systemic orientation, uh, recognize, build empathy across the, the sort of system and also build empathy, of course, for people who uh, stand to benefit or experiencing, th you know, living lives like the, perhaps not the way they'd like to right now um, and understand some of their aspirations and start to kind of, you know, cut through, join up, short circuit uh, some of these sort of silos and regimes that kind of, well, really, I think stop, stop the knowledge flowing and stop the outcomes coming yeah thank thank you and um, i mean sort of i'm torn because there's so many again so many thoughts popping up on, on this topic um one thought just a quick follow-up and maybe i'll kind of open it up for the for the audience to, to, to join the conversation after the, after that um the so we often talk about political opportunity or political windows or, or you know you have to kind of look for the opportunity for when is a good time to really introduce this stuff uh, like an agenda like this one and um, uh, well I wonder here if, if there is a sort of a let's say an innovation hype possibility which is the agenda around missions um, that Mariana was was kind enough to start and then a lot of people have followed on um, uh, and I mean 
I'm wondering here, like the, even in the way that you articulate the challenges that, that you're talking about, mental health and homeless, uh, homelessness and so on, you know, people are, at least in, in our part of the world, are starting to develop missions on this stuff, but they have no idea, uh, that's my assumption anyway, or this is my observation, uh, they're not building an infrastructure of learning and experimentation around it, obviously. So you have the, 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 the Danish Innovation Fund uh, basically just shifting the name of whatever they used to do. And now it's missions, but it's still the same funding structures and so on um, and accountability. Uh, elements. Um, but uh, is there an, an, a possibility here to really take advantage of that hype and say, well, OK, policymakers want, want missions. What they're not asking for is, is help on, on kind of the infrastructure around that. Uh, but to the extent that some of these measures are actually positioned in the social space or social sector space, um, what do you how, how, do you see that as a, an advantage or disadvantage? Is it a risk? Is it a I don't know? How do you see that? Chris, can you start? Um, yeah, I, th I think it could play out either way. Um, I think I was watching Jason's Jason's response there, but I think yeah, I think like in Denmark, I th well, I think like Ash, I think the New South Wales government has a whole bunch of missions that it that, that it's on, um, but I don't see that sort of playing out. Uh, sort of, I think it became. Well, I don't know the details, so I shouldn't shouldn't be cynical about this. But it sort of appear, appears that it might be yeah, another and a different kind of title to put above your policy priorities. Um, but I, th I think yeah, no, absolutely. If there are missions that people are identifying they want to be on then i i think it is yeah how do you build the infrastructure to um to, to get there um um yeah no i think th i think there might there may well be an opportunity i think it d depends sort of how people are interpreting it um and how people are um organizing around it but but what are, what are you saying in canada jason uh paint the town mission man <laughs> <laughs> you know if mission is purple paint the town purple um, so I, I don't know, like we managed through the social R and D fellowship before missions were a thing to yeah. get R and D on the agenda. And the reason why we were able to do that. So like, I'll, I'll share our blog post cause we got really geeky on how to use evidence on how to best influence a system when you're small. Uh, and it worked in our favor. Uh, we also had Jeff Mulgan come to town every now and again and tell everyone that social R&D was important. So that helped. Um, but I think one of the things that we really focused on and one of the things that engaged me the most with the work, uh, my, my, my backgrounds in engineering. Uh, and so when people were talking about all of their great social innovation programs, I'd ask them, so where does like R&D feature? Like, how do you... How do you, what's your mental model when you say innovation? And so that I'd spend a lot of time breaking down what the innovation arc is, which if you're uh, using like a traditional mental model around innovation, like there's this inception of an idea point, which then gets refined in something actionable. And that's like your R&D phase. And then, depending on what your R&D phase, uh, what it looks like, you're gonna put some of those uh, interventions or those kind of like novel ideas into production or into delivery. And so that's your deployment phase. And so you'll get signals on, is this new thing that emerged through R&D, is it scalable? Like what, what are some of the challenges around scale? And then when you kind of move from deployment into scale, which means, a critical mass of, uh, there's a critical uh, adoption kind of curve that's hit where this new thing that came through the R&D phase was demonstrated during a deployment phase and then has traction, you're now moving into your innovation zone, which basically means this like has been mainstreamed. It's now like your business as usual. And so if you take a classical look at innovation and a social innovation program, like I wanna see that level of sophistication on what you're supporting uh, through your funding or through your policy cover. And so I, I kind of say like, okay, like, so now that we've talked about what an innovation arc is, like, do you have a social innovation program or 
do you have something else? And so more often than not, it was about like that, that, that initial kind of embryonic phase of really like teasing out new understanding and figuring out how to apply that new understanding. That often wasn't covered in the funding. <laughs> it was often like, okay, you have something new, like go implement. And so we were implementing a lot and we were spending a lot of money, but were those high quality ideas? Like, did they go through that like path, that messy, messy path of observation, uh, distilling like ahas, and then finding a way to test your, these like new ideas, like that wasn't happening. And that like to do that well, that's like a, a like a multi like cycle effort. Like you're gonna have to do that a few times, and you might have to do it over a few years. Uh, and you like every time you come out of an I and D sprint, like there's something that could be deployed. Uh, so it doesn't mean that it will take you two years before you get results, but like it might take you a while before you're like there's something like here that is ripe for scale. Uh, and then scaling comes with a whole new set of of problems. So really challenging policymakers and funders to walk you through their innovation or their mission uh, mental model and to have the evidence to say, well, like, I'm looking at the evidence and I'm not seeing like the features of your mission oriented innovation system. Like I'm not seeing the features here. Like read the entrepreneurial state, like <laughs> pick up the evidence around uh, developmental states and what they do. Uh, and point to the features of your program that fit those, uh, those key elements. If those things aren't there, then you're, you're painting your program purple, but it's not like a mission or it's not an innovation system. Uh, I think that's, that's a really interesting uh, way of, of sort of interpreting that. Um, I, I mean, maybe I'll just uh, change uh, pace here a little bit. Uh, we've talked about Ash a bit. Uh, Ash, you had another question. I don't know if you wanna come in and, and ask that. Uh, and then for the rest of the group, um, the, this is your final chance to add a, a few questions in the chat for us to talk about. Uh, we have a limited time left, so, but Ash, go on uh, with your question. Yeah, I, th I think for me, I was just riffing on some of the things listening between Jason and Chris and, and Jason, I, I, I wondered, you know, there's always this, uh, the context of like, I think I'm, it was more a, a connection I was making to this, the quantity of like R&D so that you can then kind of really move that dial, if you will, like, you know, with, you know, it doesn't have to sit with, I mean, I think in Australia and, and, uh, and Canada and so on, yes, there's a lot of power with the government. And so, you know, kind of that's, that's one dimension there, but sometimes it could be broader in other sort of, uh, nation state context, but I, I was just wanting to make a connection to, you know, great reputable entities who are effectively, uh, actually in a dominant sense, probably volunteer run by clinicians and others who then get paired up with other researchers to then produce high quality, um, just reviews of evidence, which then gets, you know, dropped back into practice and so in the field of medicine, that's kind of been shown to be super effective. And so I'm just very specifically thinking about Cochrane collaboration. And so I, I kind of thinking about your, your quantity uh, point there, Jason, which I think is actually really important. So then the question I'm asking myself is like, well, what do I need to learn from Cochrane collaboration in terms of how they got set up and how they kind of maintain that over decades and still exist? and still morphing and adapting as their funding changes and as they have challenges. And even now you go to your best oncologist anywhere in Canada, Jason, and they'll be, you know, that's, that's the benchmark. Like they're, they're going to go and look up a Cochrane review to say if a intervention is kind of the right thing, or if whatever the emergent sort of experiments that are taking place, what's the kind of evidence around that and so on. So for me, I think there's some existing, places where we can learn from to really, uh, you know, amp up. So then similarly, the sister organization, Campbell Collaboration, yeah, put stuff out. Yeah, they're all putting kind of research evidence out, but it's like the, the development part of it and all the other parts you talked about, Jason, which a lot of people miss, right? That's where the real game is at, where, you know, you have to put your stuff out there and kind of work out if it, can you actually scale it? 
then what's all the other sort of timing elements of politics or hype or the zeitgeist and, and so on. So, so it was a, less of a question, I guess, Jason, but maybe more of a pondering um, for us as a, as a group that have come together today to listen and, and, and kind yeah. of, you know, think through this work in progress. So it was, it was yeah. more of that. That's all. Yeah. Like, I love that reflection and, and the off, like, that's what we were thinking about. Uh, as we were kind of in the social R&D fellowship space, trying to better understand, like, how do you introduce a little bit of professionalism into this without overdoing it? Because that's one of the challenges in the social mission space, like, you know, like that urgency, like that grassroots organizations, like power them over generations to achieve things, uh, uh, you know, is the over professionalization of the social sector compromising some of our social gains? Like that's something that you know people have mentioned in the past and are currently talking about. But in the medical sector, hello, she, shouldn't say Oh, daycare is over. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. So in the medical sector, it was also pretty ad hoc for uh, generations. But then it went through uh, a level of professionalism, or I don't know what happened, but things came online. So uh, there's culture shift, there was a renewed and ongoing focus on evidence. Uh, there was infrastructure to support all of that. There was legislation to support all of that. And I'm, I don't know if that's a right fit for us, but to back to, Jesper's question around missions. Like I think missions might be an interesting opportunity for us to wrap all of the things that are needed around uh, social missions and, uh, and it's making sure that there's the right quantity and quality of R&D so that we increase the likelihood of, of breakthroughs needed. Uh, Cause it's not just like one breakthrough and your social mission like check, like you're done. Like there are a number of uh, symptoms that have to be addressed, as well as the underlying root co causes. R&D has a role in all of those, but but yeah, the, the enabling infrastructure needs to be there. You're just not going to get the quantity or the quality. Uh, thank you, uh, Ash, for, for weighing in. Um, I'm going to ask you one, one final question, uh, then also looking at, at the time, uh, Chris and Jason. Um, and it sort of comes from a little bit uh, the, the previous session we had with the UNDP around kind of creating a learning organization. Um, uh, and one of the things that we've been talking with them about over the, the last six months have been about the future of the Accelerator Labs initiative. Um, uh, and there is a sort of a widespread sense that, you know, these temporary labs needs to emerge uh, into a permanent R&D function that ensures this renewal capability. And I really like that language. Uh, the, the, the issue is though, uh, once things becomes permanent, uh, they get funded from a different budget bucket, which has uh, very different criteria um, when it comes to um, you know, um, uh, what it's supposed to be doing and, and how it's held accountable and so on. So obviously the easy answer is then you, you have to develop a new parameters for that, but it's not that simple. It's certainly not in the UNDP system. Um, and I, but I think that there's a general challenge here about uh, what we are talking about as well, social R&D uh, as a permanent capacity or capability, um, or would it be okay if, if we have R&D as on a project-based level, um, assuming that these sort of temporary projects are building off each other but it keeps sort of being these cycles of dedicated, um, focused uh, spaces of learning and so on. Um, so I guess what I'm asking is sort of this, this notion of sort of temporary versus permanent and how you're thinking about that uh, as we go forward with this agenda. Does that question make sense at all? I'm not sure. Yeah, so like this, this is the question that I get asked all the time. Like, folks, like, do we really need this like R and D spend because like we should be focusing on uh, 
getting these jobs in the COVID context, given the dip in youth, employ youth uh, employment. And my response was like, your R&D function is what protects you for what's to come next. Because uh, R&D is like, a, yeah, you can, uh, you can dial up your R&D spend when there's a high level of uncertainty because you don't really know what's gonna work. Uh, but you know what you're doing now currently is not working. So dial up your R&D spend because uh, you need more of that, uh, both quality and quantity to help you navigate through the current challenge. Uh, but you also, like your R&D spend today is a down payment on your innovations down the road. And so the uh, Chris's reference to vaccines. Uh, so the mRNA vaccine, like that was a investment that was made by DARPA like a few decades ago, like w to invest in a project to work through that technology. And like, it was really important over the last two years, but it was an investment that was made a, a long time ago. So I think of R&D both as, and scholars like articulate this really well. Uh, R&D is an investment in human capital. So going through R&D cycles, it makes you that much better uh, at your job. Uh, and so we want talented people to deliver quality services and address some of these uh, social and environmental challenges. But R&D also gets you solutions uh, over the short term if you need them but it's really good at getting you solutions and breakthroughs over the longer term. So I, yeah, I like to talk about your R&D spend as being something that you dial up when you're in a period of high uncertainty where what you're currently doing isn't working. So very low risks of like doing more of the speculative work. If everything's great and you're kind of in like the complicated or easy kind of challenge or problem space, you, you don't need to invest as much uh, on, on building your R&D capabilities or your innovation capabilities. Uh, you can kind of keep that on a slow boil because it might be important for you down the road, but you should never turn that tap off. It, it leaves you pretty exposed uh, to big shifts. That would be my two cents. Mm, that's great, Jason. Um, uh, the I don't think you can. Of course, you can create value through R and D at a project level, but I don't think it's anything like the magnitude you can create if you build the, some of these broader infrastructures. Uh, and I think in building, you know, as you implied in your question, yes, but um, when building these infrastructures, I think we do really need to think about governance over these infrastructures. And I actually think there's a big innovation that could be unlocking uh, if we do look for different ways of organizing. And thanks, Ash, for sharing the Cochrane model, because that that is that that's a pretty, pretty interesting one. But, I, you know, I think if we can, I think there's an opportunity to give public stewardship over these things, I think that could be a real advantage for politicians. I think it could give them, it could make it less of their problem, provide an authorizing environment, a different kind of authorizing environment, so that they don't have to get into the kind of nitty gritty of um, I don't know, you know, kind of so social programs and, and and so on. But I think unless we're building this infrastructure, we're really going to be, um, and I think it can take many different forms. And it, uh, yeah, we have to be very careful and create the the Institute of XYZ that's really controlling in a very formal way, a particular innovation in the youth space or whatever. Um, but may maybe a few of those wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't harm it either. But like, I think it's got to be diverse and interconnected and interwoven. And, and you know, all of these, you can draw a, uh, uh, I think the sort of, for example, medical, the vaccine, the vaccines infrastructure, it's probably really messy. If you draw a real live picture of it, there's like lots of country based things and inter, inter international things. And it's like a, a very organic picture. And I think that that sort of rich fabric is what we've got to aim for creating so that we can, um, yeah, have this knowledge flow and kind of see the sort of change we need in the, and in the timescales that we need it because we're up, up against some pretty tough ones now. Thanks, Chris and Jason. I, I think, I mean, um, these are good words to end on uh, for what was a, a really, I thought, a very thought-provoking session, uh, both full of 
vision and, and imagination as well as uh, sort of pragmatic tactics. So that's probably the, the, the combination we need to apply going forward. Um, I, I like the, the, the notion uh, at the end here, Chris, around public stewardship um, uh, and public stewardship of institutional innovations that are enabling the R&D, social R&D uh, agenda to go forward. I, I think that's, that's to be explored further. Um, did remind me as well of the session we had yesterday on procurement, where we talked about procurement as a public service in its literal sense. Uh, Jason, I think what you were saying at the end here sort of reminded me that that was R&D as a public service uh, in a sense, in a very literal sense as well. But um, I want to thank you both uh, for, for sharing your work today. This was, this was amazing, I thought. Um, I want to thank everyone for uh, participating and asking great questions. Um, Ash in particular, um, and uh, I guess the learning journey continues uh, tomorrow, uh, well today, uh, I guess your time, tomorrow our time, uh, with a couple of more sessions to go, but we actually will be talking more about missions with uh, the chief executives of Vinova and, and uh, Danish Design Center tomorrow, uh, as well as talking about what this all means for reinventing public policy um, with a couple of, of great people there as well. So uh, to be continued, uh, but for now, I wanna thank you uh, all and, and wish you a, a great day or evening or night, wherever you are. And uh, hopefully we'll hear some nice music on our way out. Thank you, everyone.